गुड मॉर्निंग वेलकम टू रोम the glorious capital of the greatest superpower of the ancient world the roman empire today we will visit the symbol of the city the colosseum a beautiful and elegant building that served one purpose only the spectacle of killing let's go The construction works on the Colosseum began between 70 and 72 AD and lasted for about 10 years. The enormous structure measuring 189 by 156 meters wasn't however known as the Colosseum at that time. It bore the name of the Flavian Amphitheatre as it was a gift for the Roman people from the Flavian dynasty of emperors. It is still the largest amphitheatre ever built. Although the Colosseum was modified several times within a few years of its completion, the Emperor Vespasian, who commissioned it to revitalize the city of Rome, is regarded as its father. Originally, the Colosseum featured three stories surmounted by a podium. Its incredible height of 48 meters corresponds today to a height of a 15-story building. Incredible and elegant facade referring to the three Greek architectural orders is complemented by the iconic Roman arches. But what were the amphitheaters actually used for? Arenas were built across the empire, and the theatres were adapted to stage a distinctly Roman form of presentation, a spectacle of death, known as Munera. The fights were originally conducted as funeral rituals for influential personalities. This tradition dates back to the Etruscan times. They were private, civic events. During the Republic, Monera moved to the provisional structures on the Forum and began to increase in size, from three pairs of gladiators, the oldest source recorded, to 320 pairs in 85 BC, pitted by Julius Caesar to honor his father. During the Principate period, the Emperor took over the patronage of gladiator presentations in Rome. Supposedly, Augustus in 14 AD sponsored eight presentations in which 10,000 men fought. In the provinces, priests of the imperial cult usually financed the spectacle, as all the games and theatrical events were parts of a religious calendar honoring the deities. Bigger spectacles and more arenas were built throughout the empire as part of the Romanization of the provinces. Shows in the arena presented the audience from distant Roman lands military power during individual military combat displayed by gladiators. Wild exotic animals illustrated to the crowds the vastness of the empire. I'll describe to you some of these brutal ceremonies, so stay with me and please don't forget to push the subscribe button to help my channel grow. Thanks! The Colosseum featured 
80 entrances, 76 for the general public and 4 unnumbered, most decorated called the Great Entrances, among them North and South Gate, used by the most affluent ones, the Vestal Virgins and obviously the Emperors, and the Gate of Life and the Gate of Death, also used by the upper part of the society, but in addition by the participants. This large number of entrances was to ensure swift access to the allocated seats, as the Colosseum could accommodate more than 50,000 spectators. The lowest tier of the podium was reserved for senators, judges and high priests. On the south and on the north, two stalls of boxes were placed in the center. The first one was the imperial stall and the opposite one reserved for the magistrates. The next tier was for the nobility and the following ones for soldiers and common citizens. The highest rows of seats were intended for women, commoners and slaves. The Emperor's presence in the arena gave him a more direct access to the common citizens. In the amphitheater, the Emperor presented his role as Pater Patriae and his power over the lives of gladiators, Vitae Nesisque Potestas, made him the Pater Familius of the great family that was the Empire. I didn't know men could build such things. As the influence of the Republic's political institutions waned, it was theatrical events and chariot races that became political arenas. The competition took place both on the sand and in the stands, where it sometimes came to riots. It was in the amphitheatre that the Emperor promoted his political program. Emperors and local provincial leaders produced spectacles to please the crowds and thus maintain their political power. In 80 AD, Vespasian's son, Titus, inaugurated the very first games in the brand new Colosseum. They lasted for more than 100 days. The Emperor most likely wanted to appease the people and the gods, as during his pretty short reign, quite a lot of tragedies had happened, like, for example, the outbreak of the worst plague ever in Rome, or eruption of Mount Vesuvius, which destroyed many Roman cities, including famous Pompeii, and caused hefty damage to Rome itself. Preparations for the performances in the Colosseum, as in any other Roman amphitheatre, included negotiations between the editor and Lanista, the head of the gladiator school. Advertisements in the form of graffiti were placed on the walls. The distributed program contained the names of gladiators as well as other elements of the show. The editor organized a banquet the night before the event. In the morning he headed the so-called pomp, the parade of safety personnel. In imperial times the editor was the emperor and the pomp thus projected his power. Finally inside we can admire the sheer scale of the Colosseum. A lot of marble was used to build the Colosseum, and I mean a lot. According to sources, it was around 100,000 cubic meters of marble transported in 200 bullock carts to the building site, and they used also 1.1 million tons of concrete, stone and brick. That's an accomplishment. Let's take a look at the remains of marble statues and many other archaeological findings from the Colosseum, thanks to a permanent exhibition located on the second floor, named The Colosseum Tells Its Story. Anyway, the agenda for the Day of Games looked as follows. Animal entertainments, executions of criminals and recreations of famous battles, including mock naval battles, as well as gladiatorial duels.
killing of dangerous exotic animals in the morning symbolized the triumph of Roman civilization over wild nature. The midday executions of criminals and prisoners assured the crowd of the security of a just order by visibly removing threats to the Roman law. The afternoon gladiator games were often reenactments of Rome's historical victories over the barbarians, educating the Romans about their history and the contents of their empire. I think it was in the Valley of the Kings when I said that crowds are crazy, I completely changed my mind. Here is much, much worse. And if you want to go into the Colosseum, you have to buy your tickets online. And the best way to do it is the, to buy it the day before, especially if you want to visit the Colosseum on Sunday. Of course, these crowds of tourists are nothing when compared with those attending the ancient spectacles. Venatio, the official term for animal entertainments in Roman amphitheaters. It took place in the morning right after the parade of all contestants. Some animals were trained to perform tricks or were merely exhibited to spectators. Others were trained or forced to hunt and fight with themselves and they also took part in executions known as damnatio ad bestias when a prisoner, usually of lower status, was left in the arena with one or more animals. There were also confrontations including gladiators known as Venatores and Bestiari, who fought against the most dangerous creatures. Animals were also taking part in enacting historical events often representing mythical creatures. During the inauguration games only, thousands of animals were slain. According to Eutropius, 5,000 and to Dio, 9,000. Also, the Emperor Commodus couldn't care less about the animal's life when on one day he single-handedly killed 100 birds, spearing them from the safety of the arena's balcony. We are looking now at some of the scenes. Graffiti left on the stone seats by the ancient spectators. All ranges of animals obtained from the furthest corners of the immense Roman Empire were displayed in the arena. Most popular ones like lions, tigers, horses, vultures, crocodiles, gazelles, leopards, but also those inconspicuous like rabbits, boars and goats. Wolves, however, were spared as the sacred animals. Sometimes the animals didn't perform as expected. One account states that during the inauguration games, lions completely ignored their intended prey and let rabbits play inside their huge jaws. Another time, the rhinoceros, instead of parading around the arena, attacked a bull. There were also many instances when the animals trampled or simply ate their handlers. During almost 400 years of the Colosseum activity, around 1 million animals were killed. Their bodies were either buried in the mass graves outside the city, thrown in the Tiber River, or given to the poorest who otherwise would never eat meat. Animals that didn't die in the morning shows were often used to execute criminals during the midday. The executions were particularly cruel, creatively staged to the delight of the crowd. According to David Potter, an American historian, forms of executions were plainly calculated to debase the victim as completely as possible. Thank you.
Often naked convicts were condemned to the beasts with the crowd's chant of Ad Bestias at their trials. Strabo describes one such execution of Celorus, son of Etna, a military leader. For he was placed on a lofty scaffold, as though on Etna, and the scaffold was made suddenly to break up and collapse, and he himself was carried down with it into cages of wild beasts fragile cages that had been prepared beneath the scaffold for that purpose. Other criminals were forced to dance in luxurious clothes, which randomly explode the tunica molesta. In a macabre reconstruction of the myth, a very popular topic in amphitheaters, there was an incident as described by Suetonius when Icarus, in flight, crashed into Nero's box and splattered the emperor with blood. In another reconstruction of the conception of Minotaur by Posiphae, the condemned woman was coupled with a real bull. A macabre hard to imagine. After executions were performed during the midday, the crowds were entertained by reenactment of myths or comedies. Right after that, when the atmosphere of the morning slaughter subsided, it was time for the main event, Munera, the combat of gladiators. Gladiator derives from the Latin word gladius, which means sword. Prisoners of war provided a supply of gladiators. In 70 AD, Titus used thousands of captives from Jerusalem in various amphitheaters on his way back to Rome. However, they could gain freedom after three to five years, if survived, obviously. Over time, when gladiators from despised slaves became icons, heroes of the most popular spectacle, many free people, even nobles, joined their ranks. Although it was literally the case of life and death, the public acclaim was incomparable with any other profession. Gladiators' images and names were portrayed on many different artworks like mosaics, lamps and even funerary monuments. They were perceived as sex symbols, today would say celebrities followed by devoted groupies. Graffiti in Pompeii display nicknames of one of them, the Sigh of the Maidens and the Master of Girls. Ancients also believed that the gladiator's sweat was one of the best aphrodisiacs. However, the volunteers also had to bind themselves in servitude to a gladiatorial manager, Lanista. They swore an oath, Sacramentum Gladiatorum, by which they promised to be burned, bound, beaten and slain by the sword. Even though many gladiators were slaves or prisoners, they were paid for each fight, up to 75 sesterces, but the free men were getting much, much more. The Emperor Titus offered 100,000 sesterces, around $50,000 a day, as a bonus for each returning veteran gladiator. The cons of being a gladiator were even greater. Taking aside the risk of losing life, they were imprisoned when not fighting or training, after death simply tossed into the river or left on the barren land to rot, or if more lucky, buried in secluded graveyards. If Lanista's fighter lost the combat but survived, Lanista had a full right to end the fighter's life.
each gladiatorial fight didn't last longer than 15 minutes. During only one day of games, up to 13 fights took place, but they didn't always end with death, as gladiators were trained to wound rather than kill. It's estimated that one of eight fights ended with a slain combatant. Especially if a fight was interesting and long, both warriors were left alive. Nevertheless, it's estimated that around 400,000 gladiators were killed during the games organized in the Colosseum. There were also different types of gladiators, often set against each other to make the spectacle more interesting. Thrax, armed with a curved dagger and a round shield, Samnis, short sword and shield, Murmillo, helmet with a fish crest, sword and shield, and Eretiarius, who used net and trident to defeat his opponent. Although much less frequently, women also appeared in the arena, they were perceived rather as an oddity. They often were made to fight topless and the Emperor Domitian, the younger brother of Titus, enormously enjoyed female gladiators pitted against dwarves. There were two other peculiar kinds of warriors. Peganiarius, who used only a whip during combats with animals, and Andabate, who fought blindfolded. Even though the gladiators were stripped off from almost all their citizen, if not human rights, there was one most of the time sacred principle in the arena. They could put their fate into the hands of the crowds, naturally only after they had realized they wouldn't make it alive. Gladiator had to kneel down and raise his finger towards the emperor. He was to decide about life and death by the famous thumb gesture, called polizza verso, which means turned thumb. Normally, the ruler acted in accordance with the spectator's will, but some Roman emperors, like for example Caligula, didn't care about his popularity and almost never showed mercy. Interestingly, we all know the thumb sign from pop culture, but the truth is that there isn't any reliable source presenting how exactly the gesture looked. By the way, you can leave a thumb up after watching this episode. Right now we can take a peek into the infrastructure under the arena. One of the most remarkable features of the Colosseum was its intricate complex of lifts, capstans and trapdoors. According to the German Archaeological Institute in Rome, this imposing structure featured 24 to 28 lifts, transporting around 270 kilos each. Eight men were required to operate one lift only. If all the elevators were to be lifted at the same time, more than 200 trained people would be needed and more than 50 lions could have been brought on the arena at one time. Although there were a few attempts to end the brutal games in the Colosseum, it wasn't until January the 1st, 404, when Saint Telemachus, a monk from the eastern parts of the Roman Empire, visited the Colosseum. The church historian Theodoret relates. After gazing upon the combat from the amphitheater, he descended into the arena and tried to separate the gladiators. The sanguinary spectators, possessed by the demon who delights in the effusion of blood, were irritated at the interruption of their cruel sports and stoned him, who had occasioned the cessation. After being apprised of this circumstance, the admirable emperor numbered him with the victorious martyrs and abolished these iniquitous spectacles. The emperor mentioned was Honorius, son of Theodosius I, 
who declared Christianity the official religion of the empire. Mass murders of Christians in the Colosseum are more tradition than facts. Historians rather point to the place of these murders than Nero's circus on the Vatican Hill. The Colosseum was, however, associated with the cult of Christian martyrs. Damaged by an earthquake in the 5th century, in the Middle Ages it became a source of building material, a cemetery and a hideout for local bandits. In the 14th century, another earthquake damaged the building even more, though in the ruins its beautiful walls still stand, symbolizing ancient Rome like nothing else, a bizarre mixture of beauty and cruelty. Thank you for watching. Subscribe to continue our journey through ancient sites. In the meantime, check out my other videos from Egypt, Greece and Turkey. And see you! on another ancient site.